Derwin L. Gray is a former National Football League player as well as the founding and lead pastor of Transformation Church, one of the fastest growing churches in the United States. Transformation Church is multi-ethnic, multi-generational, mission-shaped in terms of its community with six campuses near Charlotte, North Carolina. He's working toward his doctorate at Northern Seminary and has been awarded an honorary doctorate from Southern Evangelical Seminary. Derwin's an author of Hero, Unleashing God's Power in a Man's Heart, Limitless Life, You Are More Than Your Past When God Holds Your Future, and The High Definition Leader, Building Multi-Ethnic Churches in a Multi-Ethnic World. Please give a warm welcome to Derwin Gray. old school. Uh, before I uh, jump in, I'm um, in honor of uh, my college coach, Lavelle Edwards of BYU. Uh, I'm wearing my, my BYU gear because he recently uh, passed away and um, actually cried for, for three days. And the reason why I cried for three days is because of the, the impact that, that he made in my life. So that's why I'm wearing the sweatsuit. Definitely wouldn't be wearing a business suit, so I'm wearing the sweatsuit. Uh, before I jump into what I want to talk about, I want to uh, bring up the greatest achievement of my life. Where's my wife and kids? I hope y'all didn't get far in the back because you got to come on, hurry up, quick, 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 quick. Uh, I don't know if you guys could see. Oh, yeah, there you go. You can walk up quick. Yep. There you go. Just take your time there, son. That's awesome. He's like 6'1", and this is an incredible athlete. He's fucking up. So, um, hey, you guys come up right here. This is uh, my wife, Vicki. We met our freshman year at BYU. She's an athlete as well. We'll be married 25 years on May 23rd. Yeah. And um, got a 20-year-old daughter. She's somewhere on the Riverwalk shopping right now. She's like, Dad, I already heard you speak. I'm good. And then my son, Jeremiah, is a, a sophomore. Uh, and, and so... Uh, this is my greatest legacy and my greatest achievement. And so, knowing why you coach, this is what you want to see um, one day. So, thank y'all very much. I appreciate y'all doing that. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I would not be who I am today without Converse Judson High School specifically uh, without coach D.W. Rutledge and my secondary coach, Mike Sullivan. Under your stewardship, that means to manage something that isn't yours, is the precious lives of young men and young women, student athletes. So think about this for a moment. Marinate on this for a moment. You are literally potter, you're the potter, and they are the clay, and you are shaping them for the future. Therefore, it is of supreme importance that you understand the why of why you coach. You understand the why of why you coach. This past year, um, I got finagled into volunteering um, to coach, so I had a lot of time to to do that. I know a thing or two about playing defensive back, so, um, so I was asked to coach. And, and it hit me even more, the importance of understanding the why of why you coach. I'm going to say it one more time because I'm a preacher, and that's a rhetorical device to get it in your soul, a soul tattoo. Understanding the why of why you coach, that when you get up in the morning, what is the why of why you do what it is that you do? Is it simply to accomplish and, and to win games? Because winning games can be done, but the question is, is the real game being won? And the reality is, is when you understand the why, and your why is greater than winning games, but helping young people win the game of life, you will enjoy life. And the meaningless, mundane job that you think you have becomes pregnant with excitement, pregnant with adventure, pregnant with purpose. So many people have blessings right in front of them, but they don't understand their why. 
So why do you coach? I know it ain't for the money. <laughs> I know you don't do it for the money. You see, when you understand your why, it will determine how you define success. And the way you determine success will filter out into the culture that you cultivate in your program. And that culture will form the student athletes under your care. I want you to vision cast just for a moment. When the student athletes are done with the four years under your supervision, under your stewardship, what character traits do you want them to have? What competency skills do you want them to possess? And you can't just hope for it. Because you know what hope is without a strategy? Frustration and disappointment. But when you have a plan with your strategy, hope turns into hopeism and people get high expectations. So I'm, I'm continuing to learn how to be a leader. I don't think anyone ever becomes a leader. I think it's a journey that leadership is a journey. And so as I'm learning how to become a leader, one of my soul tattoos that I'll say in my leadership context as a pastor is this. A vision of the future transforms what you do today. A vision of the future transforms what you do today. So my question for you is, what is the vision of your program? And does that a vision align with your why you coach? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through vision. I'm going to walk you through culture. I'm going to walk you through strategy, and I'm going to walk you through alignment. So I define vision multiple ways, but for today's purpose, vision is this. What is the reality in my student's life that does not yet exist that I'm committed to bringing into existence? What is that? So I transferred from a high school called Fox Tech. I'm not even for sure if, yes, all right, Fox Tech. I went to Irvin Middle School on the west side, went to Ira Ogden Elementary School, yeah. So I went to a school Fox Tech, called Fox Tech, and I transferred to Judson uh, second semester my, my sophomore year. And there was something about Judson that made me dream bigger, that made me think Larger. There, there, was, there was something about Judson that made me believe that I could accomplish anything. Now, coming from my home context where I was the only male for a while in my family who hadn't been to jail or had a drug addiction or substance addiction uh, uh, abuse or, or graduated high school, um, that was a major feat. But there was something about Judson and that something was a vision that they made me feel like I could accomplish anything, that if I was willing to work for it, if I was willing to put feet to my dreams, that it could happen. That's the power of a vision. So athletically, when I showed up at Judson as a sophomore, uh, you, you, you guys will really be impressed. I was, I was about 5'8", about 145 pounds, and I ran a blazing 5'2", 540. Just set the track on fire. But because of the vision of Judson and the aspect of, of learning how to work, the following year, I ran a, a 471. I went from starting four games as a junior to starting the whole season and becoming first team all state. Um, how did that happen? Because there was, there was a vision. You see, a vision of the future transforms what you do today. Academically, I got a vision that, that I could go to college. Like that, not just graduate high school, but, but to go to college. And I still remember after my eligibility was up, 
Coach Sullivan would take me up to his office, and he had this, this program on a floppy disk. If you're under 25, you have no idea what a floppy disk is. But it was this disk with information, and you stick it into this computer, and, and then it would prepare me to take the ACT. I took the ACT three times to get an accumulative score of 16. They averaged all the scores together, and that was what I needed at a bare minimum to get into BYU. And today I stand before you with a doctorate and earning another doctorate and graduating with a master's magna cum laude. I don't know what that means, but I think nearly a 4.0. But I trace that going back to my high school experience, that, that there's a vision, that, that you are a vision caster, a dream shaper, a life transformer. It gave me a vision socially. Coach Rutledge would always talk about making a difference in the world. And, and you know what's interesting? At Judson, I don't ever remember talking about winning football games. Like, we never talked about winning games. It was, it, it was always character-based. And one of the things that he would challenge us to is to, to make a difference in the world. And so one of the things that my wife and I did when we did go to the NFL is we, we started the Derwin Gray Foundation with education and all types of, of other things. And I, I trace that back to the late 80s at Judson because there was a vision. So my question for you is, what is your vision and does it align with your why? I just want to give an example if you don't have a vision. Maybe it could be something like this. The vision of your high school is to develop student athletes who will make a positive difference in the world by being respectful, responsible, and resilient. And so that vision guides everything that you do. And by the way, the vision will find you out as phony too. Because you can't cast a vision that has not first set a cast upon you. In other words, you can't fake it till you make it. you got to make it so others can grab it. In other words, the vision flows out of your life that you are committed to the very values that you're calling your students to. So you got to have a vision because the vision of the future transforms what you do today. And then secondly, you have to develop a culture. I define culture this way. The beliefs and behaviors that cause student athletes to flourish and embody the vision. At Judson, there was a culture. So when I transferred in, um, I wasn't as in good a shape as the rest of the kids. It, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. I would have to stay after practice to run sprints. It, it was just academically there was a culture, and what the culture did, though, is the culture grabbed me, and as I participated, lifted me up. See, when you create a culture, you are taking kids and you are lifting them up. You are, you are taking their lives and, and you're lifting them up. And so the first aspect of culture, this doesn't have to be yours, but these are some things that are valuable to me, is the first thing is respect. Uh, respect is, is having a sense of love and purpose and awe, teaching your students to respect teachers, teaching them to respect their parents. One of the things that I learned in the recent coaching experience that I have is the simple value of yes ma'am and no ma'am. That stuff is gone. And by the way, let me say this please, particularly for you coaches under the age of 30, your teenagers don't need you to be friends with them. They got enough of those. Let me say it again. Teenagers don't need you to be friends with them. They have enough of those. You are a grown person. Conduct yourself as such. On your Twitter feeds, talk like an adult with good English, because that's how you get jobs. They need adults who are modeling for them what respect is. Don't vicariously live your life through teenagers because you didn't maximize your opportunity. So out of the overflow, teaching them how to respect people. Their parents, yes sir, no sir, their teachers. How to respect practice. In the words of the philosopher Alan Iverson, I'm talking about practice. How to respect practice that when you step on the field, there is purpose, there is an intentionality. And we live in a world where people love to tweet but not get to work. It is a lot easier to tweet about what you're going to do 
than to grind under the Texas hot sun and get to work. People ask me constantly, Derwin, what was it like to go to the NFL? What was it like to play? And I'll say, let me tell you about a conference just in high school. When all the other players were inside and Coach Mike Sullivan was running me sprints after sprints after sprints. And let me tell you that when I got infected with this bug of respecting my gifts, respecting my talents, respecting opportunity, I worked and I worked and I worked and I worked and I worked. What else you want to know? W-O-R-K, work and respect. We need a generation that understands that nobody is going to give you anything. There is no free handouts. But do you believe it? Because that's where culture comes from. You are a culture connoisseur. I don't know what that means, but it sounded good. All right. Respecting teammates. Respecting your opponents. Respecting your community. By the way, people that are respectful make a difference in the world, and they make great employees and great bosses one day. Another cultural value is responsibility. We live in a culture where no one wants to be responsible anymore. The first sign of maturity is saying, I'm responsible. The first sign of growing up is, I'm responsible. How, how do we develop cultures around athletics and academics? With responsibility. One of the things that the coaches at Judson would not allow me to do was to feel sorry for myself because of where I came from. They would not allow me to allow my circumstances and my environment to define me. That my life's destiny was in the hands of no one else but my own. That I needed to be responsible. I needed to be responsible for school. I needed to be responsible in life. I needed to be responsible on the field. Creating a culture of responsibility. And then the last R is a culture of resiliency. So one of the things that we would do at Judson, and this began in practice, I'm talking about practice, is whenever there was a turnover, I, I played defense because Jesus said defense is biblical. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Jesus says it's better to give than receive. So it's better to give hits than receive them. Amen. Can I get an amen? Um, if the offense would turn the ball over, instead of us complaining that the offense turned the ball over, you know what the defense would do? All of us would, what would do, the guys who played and the guys who didn't play, is we would yell these two words, sudden change. So it wasn't an opportunity to go, oh, the offense didn't do their job. It was an opportunity for the defense to do their job. So even today, now as a 45, almost 46-year-old man that, in 2004, when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, she's cancer-free and doing great, but in 2004, when she was diagnosed with, with, with cancer, thoughts in my mind of hearing Coach Rutledge's voice saying, sudden change. A culture of resiliency. Resiliency is, I will get knocked down. Like, teach your kids, they will get knocked down. But they don't have to stay down. Resiliency is the ability to get back up after you have been knocked down in the octagon of life. At Judson, we did this thing called boot camp. And it was by far one of the hardest things that I've ever done, mentally, physically, emotionally. But even today, I rely on it for resiliency. During my NFL years, we would have rigorous workouts, and I would say things, if I can make it through a Judson boot camp, I can make it through an Indianapolis cult practice. Having a culture of resiliency. But in order to have a culture of resiliency, you have to be resilient yourself. So you got a vision. You have a, a culture. 
And then you have to have a strategy. And see, the reason why you're here is because you want this. The reason why you're here is because you want to make a difference. The reason why you're here is who knows that maybe one day one of your students that you are shaping and molding can be up here giving a speech. You want to have a strategy. A strategy is simply a plan that creates the culture that makes the vision flourish in the lives of the kids. One of the, one of the things that we did at, at Judson back in the way, and I, I, don't, I don't know if you know, but I'm, I'm pretty high on Judson because <laughs> I wouldn't be who I am today. But we would do this thing. Be, before we touched a weight or before we ran a sprint, before we did boot camp, you know what we, we, we did? We spent four days in a classroom. And we would read leadership quotes by people like Zig Ziglar and John Maxwell, and, and, and we would read about all of this character formation in a classroom. So my first year, I'm like, when are we going to lift weights? When are we going to run? When are we going to do the X's and O's? No, we were, we were in a classroom. As a matter of fact, Coach Rutledge's son, Clint, and, and this is a, a shameless book plug for my little brother that y'all need to go buy this book, or I may tackle you. I can still run uh, but it gives an example of the classroom. And so as I'm reading through it, I'm having all these memories of going, wow, here is high-level leadership development that's taking place. So you have to have a strategy to make it happen because it's not going to happen. Check it out. If you leave it up to chance, there's a great chance it won't happen. You got to have a, a strategy. Even the way you conduct your practices, the organization, the, the tempo. And I want to encourage you to that in the midst of your strategy, be very demanding, but don't be degrading. Be demanding, but don't be degrading. Let me say it one more time. Be demanding to call out the greatness in them, but don't be degrading to beat them down. One of the aspects of being a leader is this, and, and this is one of the things that you've been tasked with. As a leader, you will see in kids what they don't see in themselves. If somebody would have told me as a sophomore at 5'8", 145 pounds, 5'2", 540, the Derwin one day, you would be inducted into the Judson High School Independent School District Hall of Fame, that you'd be a BYU legend, that you'd be a team captain in the NFL, that you would do the things that you've done. If somebody would have told that kid that at 15 years old, I would have never believed it. And so you know what you have the privilege to do? And I hope you hear me. What you have the privilege to do is to speak into a young person's life and call out their destiny. You have that power in your hands to literally reach into their souls and pull out who they could become. That is greater than any championship trophy. The greatest trophy you can ever have is to pull out of someone what they were meant to be. That when you wake up, your why has got to be bigger than a paycheck. Your why has got to be bigger the wins and losses, it's got to be the person that all around you are walking treasures. And the ones who are messed up the most may actually have the deepest treasures inside of them. I grew up as a compulsive stutterer. I was just telling my son that uh, when I played in the Texas high school all-star game, I drove five hours in a truck with Coach Rutledge from San Antonio to Dallas. He said, I said five words. My son was like, really? <laughs> I was a compulsive stutterer. I just got back from Israel. I got to speak all over the world. You know why? Because there are people like you who said, I see something in that kid. Yeah, the one that stutters, the one that's slow, the one that's struggling, the one that is taking basic math as a senior. I, I see something in them. You have the ability to call out that greatness. And then number four, number four, and I'm going to be briefly with this, is alignment. Is alignment. And what I mean by alignment is this. Coaches, 
make sure you've got other coaches who are in alignment with your vision, with your culture, and your strategy. Listen, we can say whatever we want to about New England Patriots, whether, you know, deflate gate. Let me, let me tell you something. If a little bit of air out of a football make you give up 49 points in a game, you got bigger problems. <laughs> I'm just saying. Been there, done that. I'm just saying. Been there, done that. <clears throat> Make sure that you have coaches who are bought in to developing student athletes to be successful in the world. Because ultimately, that alignment is going to help your kids to fulfill their assignment, which is the assignment of life. So, so make sure you gather like minds around you. Be selective. If you're a person of prayer, be prayerful. Be selective because the leadership team you create will empower the organization and the kids that you lead. Our church is seven years old, and we've got influence around the world. It is absolutely crazy. But one of the reasons why is we're very strategic about our leadership teams, that they are committed to the vision, they're committed to the culture, they're committed to the strategy, that there is alignment. And then what that allows us to do is to be able to equip our congregation. I tell our church all the time, listen, guys, y'all can call me pastor, but I'm just a football coach. You guys are the team. And when we get together to gather, this is the huddle so we can go out and win the game of life. But you need teammates that are in alignment. Let me conclude with this story. Knowing your why. Why do you coach? So just yesterday, uh, my wife and I and some other leaders at Transformation Church play, uh, prayed with a, a couple, uh, Pam and Dwayne. You, you, don't, you don't know Pam and Dwayne, but l let me give you a little sketch. About seven years ago, Dwayne showed up at our church. He was divorced from his wife, and uh, he's a Caucasian fellow from South Carolina. So that, that, that means he's country, not, not, not Texas country, but a whole different kind of country, South Carolina country. He and his wife were divorced. Uh, it, it was just awful. His life began to change under the Ministry of Transformation Church, and after about six or seven months, we noticed his wife starting to come to church, and she'd sit by him. They'd start to get closer, they begin to hold hands, and a little bit of time goes by, and they end up getting remarried. Just absolutely beautiful. Well, just recently, the wife was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And if you know anything about pancreatic cancer, that's, that's not a good thing. And so my wife and several other leaders of Transformation Church, we are huddled around them and, and praying for them. Caring about them that they have, they have families. And you're asking yourself, well, what does this got to do with coaching? Everything. Because some of the first people who taught me to care we're coaches. Know your why. Because futures, people's lives depend on it. You all can be great coaches if you define greatness and success the right way. Thank you, guys.